third of three videos in chapter four. I am not covering the French and Indian War. That will be in the next section. But we need to spend some time on Ben Franklin, who I call the poster boy for the Enlightenment. Perfect segue. He is a transition figure in between English and American. He embodies in his life and in his works and his thought the story of America. He becomes the symbol of America, not only to Americans, but to anybody in Europe as well. And as one friend in England said, his face is as well known as that of the man in the moon. He also embodies in his life and his thought the change from Puritanism to capitalism. He is in many ways a poster boy for capitalism too. So he is hugely important, not so much, we all know Ben Franklin with the kite thing as an inventor, but for his ideas and these things that he spread in American society. So who is Ben Franklin? First of all, he lived forever. He was born in 1707, he dies in 1790. Anything that's going on in America in the 1700s, Ben Franklin is there and he's probably chairman of the committee. His ancestors, he is pretty much British, although I think there's some Scottish in there because he was huge, he was like six foot three, six foot four, something like that. Um, they were not poor. His ancestors were involved with the silk trade. They owned books. They were in blacksmithing. His dad uh, emigrated to America for religious freedom because they had become Puritans and Puritans were being oppressed in England. So when his dad came, there wasn't much use for silk trade in America, but he becomes a candle maker. Lots of need for candles. Ben Franklin is the 15th of 17 children, same woman, and the 10th son. He's born when his parents are much older. Uh, he is the youngest son of the youngest son in five generations. That's supposed to be very lucky. So he is raised in a very poor, very strict, very hardworking Puritan family. Again, long lives. His parents lived uh, close to 90s, almost as long as he did. He was put in school because all Puritan children go to school, and he was number one in his small little school, but he had to drop out after two years at the age of 10 because he had to help his dad in the business. So he, he learned some basic literacy at school, but not much more. But this was a kid who was clearly very, very bright and desperate to learn. And he called it borrowing. We would call it stealing. He would steal books from the households of his little friends. He would take them home without asking and stay up all night by candlelight reading and then return them hopefully before they noticed they were gone the next day. So he read Locke, he read the great philosophers, he read religious theory, a political theory, although he said, I have raised myself. He taught himself basically, he self-educated. He later in Europe received dozens of honorary degrees and self-taught himself. I always find this amazing because I hate learning languages. Uh, Latin, French, Spanish, Italian, and German. By the time he's 12 or 13, he's over six feet. He's a big, strong kid. And he was apprenticed to an older brother who had a little print shop and was printing only the second newspaper in America. But of course, in Boston, everybody's literate and there's a need for newspapers. At that time, if you printed things that were critical, critical of the government, you were thrown in prison for it. And his brother is jailed, not for writing the article, but for printing, printing a critical article in his paper. They jailed the publisher, not the writer of the article. Ben is all of 15, 16 years old. He takes over the print shop because his brother's in jail for six months or so. He prints the newspaper. And not only that, he writes his own column, not under his own name, but as an old woman named Silence Duguid. And he printed a series of satirical attacks on the government, on the British governor, on Puritans, on the king, on the Bible everything. Why they didn't throw him in jail, I don't know, but they didn't for whatever reason, because these were very sarcastic attacks. Uh, he was known later on, he had, you know, there's always this secret side to Ben. And if you look at that first picture of him with the furry hat, 
he's not looking at you. He's looking sideways at the painter, at the artist. And that's a pretty good indication of Ben. He used over 90 pen names and at least 43 signatures that we know of. So you never know what's going on with Ben. You don't know the whole story. There's a lot of mystery there. Okay, brother got out of jail, comes back. Um, clearly there's a little bit of jealousy because Ben had, you know, the, his column was widely popular. The circulation of the paper had increased and his brother uh, starts basically whacking him around and Ben is not obedient and he leaves. He says, I am out of here. With a dollar in his pocket and a change of clothes, he went to the biggest city in the colonies at the time, Philadelphia, where he found himself in a people and a culture that was very tolerant. Remember, they're Quakers, not Puritans. He never left Philadelphia. He loved Philadelphia. He apprenticed there with a printer. It's the only trade he knew. At uh, 22, he went to England and to get some printing equipment that he had been promised by some financial backers. Turned out uh, they misled him. There was no financial backing. He stayed in London, worked there for a printer, borrowed some money, borrowed the printing equipment, came back to America and set up a print shop. While he was in London, he loved to go swimming. He's a very big athletic kid. He loved to go swimming in the Thames River that flows through London. And he was such a good swimmer. One of his first inventions what would, are what we would call flippers today. Swimming fins, he called them. Um, he was such a good swimmer that he started to, other people would ask him, can you teach my son to swim? And he started teaching the sons of wealthy men to swim. And one of them offered him a permanent position. Look, you can start essentially a swimming school. You're so good at this. He thought about it and he turned it down and went back to America set up his own print shop. It's very successful from the beginning. He's a very good manager, very smart guy. At 28, he begins to get some government contracts, which we all know are very lucrative. So he's got print work from the government. For 20 years, he works like a dog in his print shop. He expanded and set up uh, satellite print shops in other states, including one in the Caribbean. He actually made a paper mill set up his own paper mill. At 42, he retires from the printing business. Very, very wealthy. Ben Franklin ended up being one of the most wealthy people in the entire colonies. And this is a kid who started out with a dollar in his pocket. So the rags to riches story, Ben Franklin is one of the successes. Um, personality, always questioned authority from childhood, always very curious, always very intellectual. He marries soon after he establishes his printing business to a poor, barely literate woman. And we don't know what was going on with this. Uh, she had been previously married, her husband had disappeared, so her prospects were kind of limited. Uh, probably more to the point, when he marries, Ben brings into the marriage a four-year-old bastard son an illegitimate child. And Deborah, his new wife, was willing to accept the child and raise it as her own. Many people probably would not have been. So that may be, we don't know. But here's one of the most literate men in the colonies who marries a woman who's barely functionally literate. On the other hand, she's a darn good business manager. When he's overseas for years at a time, it is Deborah who manages the home, manages the business, and does very well with it. So, this illegitimate son survives. Uh, he goes ahead and has a son and a daughter with Deborah. The daughter survives. The son dies at four of smallpox. So there are descendants of the Franklins today. Franklin lived to be 84. He's there everywhere throughout the American history, throughout the 1700s. He is poster boy for the Enlightenment. He is a great experimenter, a great scientist, and was acknowledged in America and Europe as one of the greatest. His goal was never to make money off of it, although that's a very American thing. In fact, people told him, you need to patent this. You need to control the production of this. He refused. I would rather have it said he lived usefully than he died rich. Money meant nothing to him. He devoted the last half of his life to public service 
and often was not paid a dime in salary. But he is a man of the Enlightenment. His inventions, particularly with electricity and the lightning rod, that was uh, new in Europe and America. He also invented or pioneered, and this is just the short list, and I won't ask you by name any of these things, but this is the short list. If there's something they need in Philadelphia, ask Ben Franklin, he'll figure out a solution to it. Of course, as you can see in that painting of him, the bifocals are a Franklin invention, the first lighthouse in America, the first odometer to measure distance, the Franklin stove, which was a huge improvement over cooking over an open fireplace where a lot of women were burned to death because they wore long skirts. The Franklin stove basically was a metal box to contain the fire. And you put a chimney, a flue up through the wall and the smoke escaped. Um, that's largely a Franklin invention. Of course, he's looking at German stoves and making an American simple, cheap reproduction of them. Um, Daylight savings time, you can blame him for that. All kinds of little gadgets. He is the first to really chart and measure the Gulf Stream. Some of his public works that became the basis of American society. The first public library to lend books freely to the public. The first fire department. The first public free hospital. The first street lights in an American city. The US Postal Service is Ben Franklin's Postal Service. And recently, they were thinking about closing the original post office building in Philadelphia and changed their mind because Ben Franklin set that up originally. A central water system for clean water, the local militia, uh, met the concept of matching grants is Ben Franklin's. He created single-handedly our first um, scientific society, the American Philosophical Society, after he retired, set up the American Academy to study sciences, which became the University of Pennsylvania, and the University of Pennsylvania still today is known for its study of sciences. That's where you go if you want to be a scientist, one of the schools in America. So, Ben Franklin, huge scientist, he is also a man of the Enlightenment in his ideas, which are much more important than him as a scientist. Okay, I will talk about his politics later in the Revolution where he's really important. Um, unusual for a wealthy man, he becomes more radical and more democratic as he gets older. From the beginning, absolutely a strong Democrat. He said during the French and Indian War, it is supposed an undoubted right of Englishmen not to be taxed, but by their own consent given through their representatives. So he stands up for democracy well before the revolution. He is a deist, never joined a church when he got to Philadelphia, raised a strict uh, Puritan, um, believed in a good God, believed that every man creates his own salvation, you have free will. When he died, interestingly enough, he left in his will money for all the different churches in Philadelphia. Maybe he was hedging his bets. Who knows if God's a Presbyterian or a Puritan. Very pragmatic, man of the enlightenment. Um, whatever works, Ben Franklin will come up with a solution. During the French and Indian War, uh, one of the American ministers with the American troops was complaining to Ben Franklin, nobody's coming to prayers on Sunday. I can't get any of these soldiers to come. They're out drinking and having a good time. Ben says, okay, there's a simple solution to that. After you give the service, pass out rum. Problem solved. Very practical solution. Had a good sense of humor. When he signed the Declaration of Independence, he knew like everybody who signed it, if they lost the war, this is a death sentence. He has committed treason. And he joked to one of the other signers. Now, Ben Franklin was a pretty hefty guy by that time. He's six foot something, and he had gotten a little plump in his old age. One of the other signers was this rail thin, small guy. And he, Ben said to him, I shall have a great advantage over you, Mr. Gary, when we are all hung for what we are doing. With my weight, I will die in a few minutes but from the lightness of your body, you will dance in the air for at least two hours before you are dead. So while he's signing his death sentence, he is making jokes about it. The most important thing about Ben Franklin is his American system. 
which you have down there, which he did in a number of different ways. It is Ben Franklin who creates the impetus for capitalism in America. He codified how to succeed in America. He even called himself, I'm advertising America. I'm an advertisement for America. He removed basically the Puritan religion. He kept some of the Puritan ethics. He mixed it with hard work and, uh, Pur and Quaker thrift in Philadelphia. This is a good God, not a punishing God. And in everything he wrote and published, he promoted this same idea. So how do you become successful? In everything he wrote, you work hard, as he called it, and you are virtuous, virtue and hard work. You're a good person and you work hard. Don't forget the good person part. In America, we all remember you work hard, you'll succeed. Ben Franklin said that's half of it. You have to be virtuous as well. So he comes up with an almanac. We still have a farmer's almanac with his picture on the cover. He did it under an alias, by the way, not under his real name. And in the almanac, he put together, it's kind of like a mini encyclopedia, all the information anybody would need to farm successfully in the new world. So he had the tides, he had the phases of the moon, he had when to plant different things, the dates of the first frost, the last frost, what to do about different things, the different strains of wheat and barley and corn that were good for different regions. It was a guide to farming in America. Um, <laughs> you get off the boat as an immigrant, how do you succeed in America? You have land, land is readily available, either free or very inexpensive, and you buy a copy of Poor Richard's Almanac not only do you make Ben Franklin incredibly wealthy because he sold millions of these, but you have the handbook on how to succeed in American farming, which was different than British farming. He also put in lovely little sayings in there uh, that and pe some people and still do buy it for the lovely little sayings. Um, time is money. It's Ben Franklin who came up with no pain, no gain. Um, Doors of wisdom are never shut. All these cute little sayings, one of my favorites, we are all born ignorant, but one must work hard to remain stupid. I like that one. Another one, which you probably knew about, keep your eyes open before marriage and half shut afterwards. So all kinds of lovely little aphorism sayings. The second thing he wrote, because people asked him all the time, how did you succeed? How did you become one of the wealthiest men in America? And he wrote The Way to Wealth. Virtue and hard work. This comes pretty much straight out of the Quakers in Philadelphia. You need both. How did you become wealthy in Europe? You inherited it. End of story. That was pretty much it. Britain was ruled by pretty much 400 wealthy families. The poor had almost no input. In America, where everybody is middle class, except for parts of the South. Um, what Ben Franklin does is say that any work is honorable and you can become successful doing anything. So even manual labor, even if you are a day laborer, even if you're a street sweeper, be a good street sweeper, be virtuous, work hard, you will succeed in your life, okay? He made all work honorable. And he said the way to succeed, and here's how I did it, is I worked very hard, which he did, and I was virtuous, which he was. If you want the motto of America, it is Ben Franklin's. He said repeatedly, in America, people do not ask, who is he? What's his title? What's his position? What's his family? But they ask, what can he do? In America, people do not ask, who is he, but what can he do? Now, of course, the problem we have today is um, how do you get wealth and remain virtuous? It was less of a problem for Ben Franklin. The last thing he wrote later in his life is his autobiography, but the revolution came along and it ends where the revolution starts, unfortunately. But he wrote about, again, this is how you become successful. Virtue and hard work equals success here on earth, not like the Puritans. This is capitalism. We're not worried about going to heaven. You will be successful on earth. 
And in the autobiography, he codified 13 habits that anybody could copy. This was the mo and is the most widely read autobiography in the world. When Davy Crockett was killed at the Alamo, he didn't have a Bible in his pocket. He had Ben Franklin's autobiography. Everybody read it. Okay, basically, he said, here are the good habits that you need to succeed in life. And if you follow these, and he made a chart and he systematically worked on these habits one at a time. Um, he did succeed in all of them. Quick rundown of these. Temperance, don't do anything to excess. Silence, don't open your mouth unless you have something to contribute. Don't just talk. Um, I wonder what he'd say about the internet. Uh, be orderly, keep everything in order. Carry through what you resolve to perform. Frugal, don't waste. Waste nothing, he said literally. Industry, always be busy. Cut off on unnecessary actions. Uh, don't be deceitful, be sincere, think innocently. Justice, wrong no one. Moderation, avoid extremes in all things. Cleanliness, be clean in your body, your clothes, and your housing. Tranquility, don't let little things upset you. Humility, a friend said, hey, you need something else here. And he put in humility, imitate Jesus and Socrates, be humble, which he was. The last one he had some issues with. He could do all of these. He was successful one reason. He never drank. Everybody was drinking constantly or half drunk around him. If you never drank in colonial America, you were ahead of the game. You were much more productive. And Ben Franklin figured that out as a young boy. The last one he had problems with. And it was called chastity. I will read his definition of it. Rarely use sex, but for health or offspring. Never to dullness, weakness, or the injury of your own or another's peace or reputation. Not a bad definition. But Ben Franklin also said, we called it sin so we could enjoy it more. Um, he loved the ladies. I will talk about that when he's in Europe. He was surrounded by crowds of much, much younger women in Europe. Uh, remember, he brings an illegitimate child into his marriage. So at a very young age, he's really involved with the ladies. And he said, you know, I could do all these other things. I could be frugal. I could be orderly. I could be quiet. I could be tempered. Um, chastity was a problem for me. So you might look up Ben Franklin's 13 rules. It's not a bad list to be successful. Still works today. Take care. Have a good day.